Hello and welcome back. This is the week three lecture. So I realized I got a little ahead of myself last week. We actually covered the reading that was originally scheduled for week three. And we skipped over the poems that were originally scheduled for week two. So we'll just go back in time here in week three and we'll cover the material that we were supposed to cover in week two. So that includes the one poem by Richard Wilbur, multiple poems by Elizabeth Bishop, uh, a few poems by John Berryman, and then we'll also cover Grace Paley's short story, A Conversation with My Father. That was originally scheduled for week three, but it was supposed to go along with uh, the Kerouac and the Vonnegut that we discussed last week because Paley, like those two guys, is obviously writing prose fiction. So I really wanted to have a week on prose fiction and a week on poetry just to model some basic analytical strategies that we can take with these different forms of literature. But today is going to be a little bit of a mixed bag because we'll cover the poetry first uh, and then we'll finish with Grace Paley's uh, short story. So we'll continue to essentially do what we did last week. I don't really want to uh, interpret or analyze these poems or texts for you guys. Just like last week, what I would really like to do here is just sort of identify interesting items, uh, identify interesting pieces of text that you could potentially return to. So we're going to try to, you know, sort of identify some key features of the text that we're looking at this week, just like we did last week. So again, this sort of examples of things that you guys could explore further. These are items or devices or features that you could really spend you know, multiple paragraphs about. You might be able to build an entire paper around some of these. You might be able to make, you know, an original argument about some of these, but just examples of things that you can work with, things that you can identify in your own reading and then return to and work with more. So you don't have to end up finding the exact things that I'm talking about today. Again, these are just examples. This is just sort of a general modeling activity so you guys can kind of see how a lot of this work gets done. So I thought we could start on page 286 with the Wilbur poem, Love Calls Us to the Things of This World. Pretty famous poem from the 1950s. I'm guessing some of you have probably read it before. And what I really wanted to start uh, by talking about today is sort of the, the, the pitfalls of getting too fixated on thematic material. So you guys know, if you're ever in doubt about the overall theme of a text, the overall point, the larger meaning, whether it's a poem, short story, novel, play, it doesn't matter. You can find that information. We all know that information is readily accessible online. You can always find a synopsis. You can find plot summaries, of course, and then you can generally find overviews of the major thematic material. And this poem is no different. It's pretty famous for sort of being about the soul, being about some of these larger truths, perhaps. Remember what we talked about in week one, you know, capturing lived experience. I think Wil uh, Wilbur is thought to maybe be doing that here, but he's doing it through sort of an elaborate metaphor or sort of a series of images, a central conceit here that we'll talk about a little more. And that helped him to sort of, uh, you know, wander off into these larger considerations about human life, the soul, how we're all connected or how we all perhaps share certain things. Uh, so yeah, we can always find the theme. We can always talk about theme. But I just wanted to caution you guys about, you know, not getting too fixated on theme. Don't let the consideration of theme sort of drown out all other potential avenues of analysis. Because what I find interesting about this poem, and one way that you might 
approach it as an analyzer is to not just think about where we end up. Because again, the, the theme of the poem has been written about, it's pretty well documented. You could certainly arrive there, but, but how do we get there? How do we get to these, to these sort of larger ideas about interconnectedness and the human soul? Because we don't necessarily start with those larger considerations, we end there. We start with something a lot more everyday and sort of mundane or routine, maybe not anymore, this is a little bit old fashioned, but we have to start the poem by thinking about laundry. We have to think about clothes hanging on a line outside an apartment window in some urban, you know, big city setting. Because that's where we are. That is our location. That is our, uh, our setting here in the poem. And we start with an image of clothes. And we really spend, I would say, maybe the first three stanzas probably really sort of talking and thinking about the clothes <laughs> but what we have to recognize is the clothes ultimately serve as an important image maybe an important symbol maybe they function as sort of a metaphor they eventually get wilbur or the speaker of the poem we don't necessarily have to assume it's wilbur himself but somebody similar to him probably the speaker of the poem eventually sort of uses the clothes as a springboard to like i said larger considerations about human life uh the arc of our lives our souls, which is all great, but we should spend a little bit of time in those first few stanzas just thinking about the close. See, this is a key thing to do sometimes with poems because poetry can often seem rather abstract, and a lot of lyric poetry is abstract. It might not really be telling a clear narrative in the way a novel or a short story often will, so we can sometimes feel alienated by the poetic language, uh, by the sort of intricate structures and patterns that might be on display. And we might not always have a clear sense of like what's going on in the text. And I think sometimes students don't even think very much about what's going on because they're in a hurry to just arrive at that larger thematic material, that larger theme or message. But here, I would really encourage you guys to think about like what's being described. Like really consider the subject matter here. Uh, what sort of process is being described? What do we hear and what do we see at the beginning of the poem? Because there is action, maybe not a lot, but we have our speaker waking up, looking outside, but we also have sort of an auditory bit of imagery in the first line when we hear about the cry of pulleys. So there's kind of a mechanical process going on, not just in that first stanza when the clothes are maybe kind of hoisted up in the air, but later we learn about some further movement that the speaker is observing with the clothes. And eventually the way the clothes are moving or the way he perceives the clothes <laughs> starts to get him into a larger consideration of what we might consider, you know, sort of like bigger picture things, bigger ideas. Uh, and that takes us eventually to that larger theme. But let's think about the journey. Let's not always be in a huge hurry to just get to the destination. How does he take us? to that larger thematic consideration by the end of the poem. How do the clothes function? Like I said, as a, as a central metaphor, they're a central figure, or what we might call a conceit, kind of the central idea that gives the poem life and a shape and a direction. So we really should think about this poem as being somewhat action-oriented, even if our speaker is mostly just sitting around looking and thinking. At least at first, he's looking and thinking about specific actions, processes, movements, and tangible things. Again, a lot of times it helps our poetry analysis if we can anchor ourselves 
to something tangible, something practical. And in this case, we have a very common occurrence to start the poem. At least it would have been common back in the 1950s to have clothes hanging up sort of in between buildings uh, on these clotheslines. So start there. That's very practical. That's very tangible. That's a very material process. It involves real things, <laughs> real objects. It's not just thought. Eventually, we end up in more of a sort of elevated, uh, you know, sort of mental state, uh, maybe a spiritual sort of uh, state. But that's not necessarily where we start. We start with something material, practical, every day. And then those items, those clothes on the lines, eventually take us somewhere else. So let's track that journey. A uh, couple of things we can also observe here if we are interested. Obviously, with poetry, we can always think a little bit more about poetic form and structure. That's always going to be potential fuel for an analysis. Like I was saying last week, we should always do a little bit of close reading no matter what text we're looking at. No matter if it's a short story, novel, poem, we should always dig into the language for at least a little while. Identify some key words, you know, some important phrases, maybe notice you know, something about word choice or about tone and style like we were doing last week. And again, we can do that with prose fiction, so we can certainly do it with poetry, which is even more distinctive, often distinguished by what we would consider to be poetic language. Poetic language isn't exclusively the province of poetry, but we're going to see it a lot in poetry. Metaphor, symbolism imagery, but also things like meter and rhyme scheme, which are pretty unique to poetry. I mean, we can find imagery, symbolism, and metaphors in any kind of literature, but when it comes to specific poetic features that we're not really going to find in a novel or a short story, that's when we talk about meter, we, think we can talk about stanzas and how they're organized, and then we can also talk about rhyme scheme. As we know, not all poems have a rhyme scheme. Not all poems have a regular meter either. But a lot of poetry, and the examples that we're looking at this week certainly, have some kind of structure. What we might call some kind of poetic form. And the form can vary. Uh, once we get to Elizabeth Bishop, we're going to notice some very specific uh, poetic forms that she's borrowing, sort of older forms that have been passed down from other places, other sort of traditions, uh, but she's putting her own spin on them. Here in Wilbur's poem, you know, if you look at the intro to Wilbur, the editors of the book mention his wit and his metrical skill. So he's obviously considered sort of a highly skilled poet when it comes to aspects of form. He has, you know, a certain control or mastery of meter. So when you read that, if an editor points that out to you, you might want to think a little bit about what meter the poet is using. And I know some of this stuff can be kind of hard to detect, but I just wanted to walk us through a little bit uh, of this today. And just a reminder, you can always look this up. I don't necessarily expect you guys to always be able to identify the meter in a poem, but that's always something you can Google. And then once you know what it is, you can look for it and better understand it. So I think they tell you this at some point, maybe in the book or maybe not. This poem is written in what we call blank verse. So that means unrhymed lines of iambic pentameter, which is a very common English language poetic meter that you guys have certainly encountered before. So if we're dealing with iambic pentameter, that means we have five iams per line. Okay, And an iam is just a type of metrical foot. And there are other types, but the iam is probably the most common that we see in English language poetry. You guys have probably learned this before, and I am just consists of two syllables, right? The first syllable being short and unstressed, and then that's followed by what we call a long or stressed syllable. So that two-syllable unit 
is an I am. And if we have five I am's per line, like we mostly do here, you can kind of do some quick adding and determine that we have 10 syllables per line. Right? If we have five I am's and each one of those I am's consists of two syllables, five times two is ten, and we can just sort of go through line by line and count up our syllables. And oftentimes if you end up with ten, there's a good chance you're looking at iambic pentameter. But a lot of times we will have end rhyme with iambic pentameter. When we don't have regular end rhyme, then it's considered blank verse. And Shakespeare wrote in that a lot. So it's been around. And again, blank verse just means it is iambic pentameter, but it's not rhymed. So we don't have a regular end rhyme scheme here. But we can notice a lot of examples of what's often called internal rhyme. And internal rhyme is often caused by alliteration where we have multiple words occurring in close proximity that all start with the same letter or the same sound. So we can see a lot of examples of alliteration in this particular poem. And also internal rhyme can be created by assonance and consonance. So assonance is when we get the repetition of certain vowel sounds. And then consonance is the same idea, but it's the repetition of certain consonant sounds. So what, what we end up with when we have a lot of this in a poem is we have words that almost rhyme. They don't exactly rhyme, but they sound a lot alike because they have similar sounds, similar letters. So it creates a pattern. It creates a rhythm or a cadence or a recognizable structure, even in the absence of a regular uh, end rhyme scheme. So I just put down a few uh, examples here. Like think about the words eyes and cry. Okay, so we see both of those words in the first line of the first stanza. Eyes and cry. They don't quite rhyme, right? Not, not fully, but they contain a similar vowel sound. So by putting them in close proximity, we have a similar sound that gets repeated, and then that sort of helps to establish a little bit of a reading rhythm. Lots of alliteration. We could find plenty of examples. I just wrote down a few. Again, these are words that all you know, appear pretty closely together. So I have uh, spirited, sleep, and soul. Obviously, we're sticking with that opening S sound. Later, we get air, a wash, and angels. So sticking with that A sound at the beginning of those words. So lots of examples of that. Wilbur does it throughout the poem. And then if you look at the final stanza, uh, the word undone near the very end of the poem, the word undone comes at the end of a line. And then in the middle of the next line, we have the word none. So undone and none, they kind of rhyme, but again, we're not getting a regular end rhyme. One of those words comes at the end of a line, but the other one doesn't. But again, they're pretty close together. They have similar sounds. They sound somewhat alike. So we get a lot of that uh, throughout the poem. Also, based on the way this looks in my book, I would say we mostly have five line stanzas here which we could call quintets. But some people interpret some of those uh, bottom lines of the stanzas to actually be separate stanzas. Doesn't really look like that in our book, but in some other editions, if you see this poem in other forms or versions uh, online, it might look like we actually have more stanzas. So that's kind of your call, but that's another level beyond meter and rhyme scheme. You should always think about stanzas. Right? What kinds of stanzas do we have? Do we have sort of a regular stanza formation where all of the stanzas have the same number of lines? Or is it irregular? You should always look for that. And certain types of old poetic forms will have requirements, <laughs> in some cases, about meter, about rhyme scheme, or potentially about stanzas. So just taking a type of poetry that most people are at least somewhat familiar with, the sonnet. 
right? The sonnet has a lot of rules, right? If you're following the traditional sonnet form, you have to use iambic pentameter. Uh, you have to have certain types of stanzas. You have to have a certain number of lines total. And you have to have a certain like stanza formation. You have like quatrains and then you finish with a couplet. Uh, so you have to follow those particular rules if you're writing a traditional sonnet. A lot of contemporary poets aren't always interested in following all of those rules. They might follow some and break others. So this is something we can kind of observe as we move into more sort of modern literature, and you guys already know this. If we're talking about poetry in the second half of the 20th century, we're going to see a lot of examples of free verse, poetry that doesn't really conform to a lot of specific rules about form, about rhyme, meter, stanza, or overall line length. So, you know, free verse is pretty much what it sounds like. It can be free. It's open. You know, traditional poetry is often called closed form because the forms were sort of specific and in some people's minds restrictive. And you had to be inside that particular form, like what I was saying with the sonnet or we're about to see with Sestinas or Villanelles. They have very specific rules about word choice, stanzas, how certain words get repeated, how many stanzas you can have, right? A lot of contemporary poets kind of reject a lot of that, but it doesn't mean that they aren't still using some of those traditional forms. It's just that now somebody write, you know, somebody might write a sonnet that doesn't necessarily follow all those traditional sonnet rules. It might follow some, it might be subversive or sort of innovative in other ways. And that's how a lot of poets can kind of put their own spin on older forms. Uh, but while we're talking about that, let's go ahead and turn to the Bishop poems, uh, which begin on page 54. And let's take a look at sort of some examples of what I'm talking about. Again, it's good to read the intro on Bishop just to learn a little bit about her life learn a little bit about her career and her style. They make some interesting uh, points about her. They talk about her formal gifts and how, again, like Wilbur, she's kind of a master of meter and just poetic form in general. But what's interesting about Bishop, I, a lot of students tend to respond pretty favorably to her, even though there might be certain old-fashioned elements at work in her poetry, but she has a certain directness. There's a certain lucidity and clarity that we get in her poetry that I'm not sure we always necessarily detect in other poetry. And they mention that in the intro before her poems start. They talk about how her gifts, her style, results in what they call ordered and lucid structures. I want us to hang on to that phrase a little bit and think about it more. Ordered and lucid structures. What exactly does that mean? Again, I think they're sort of talking about poetic form. They're talking about the structures of her poems, the stanzas, individual lines, and the patterns that we can detect in the texts. But what they say is the ultimate result here, uh, you know, we get these ordered, lucid structures that apparently help us to hold strong feelings in place. You could argue this is kind of what Bishop is known for, creating really indelible images or really specific uh, descriptive experiences that we remember both because they're evoking strong emotions, but also because they're so well organized, they're so clear and lucid and clearly presented that they stick in our minds. So this is kind of a reminder that we never have to fully separate form or structure from meaning, right? Oftentimes the form or the, you know, the, 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 the poetic form or the structure of a text will often 
be directly tied to the overall thematic material that the poem is trying to express. Sometimes we, we sort of divide those two considerations. We think about form on one side, and then we think about the larger theme on the other side. But remember, form is part of how the author is expressing that larger theme. So we have to think about the relationship between what we might think of as content and form, structure and meaning. How do they correspond? How does one sort of feed in to the other? So if we're thinking about Bishop, she's often sort of, you know, considered to uh, be very descriptive. She had a lot of interests in like uh, sort of social science, like anthropology, but also the hard sciences botany. She was interested in geography. She was a bit of a traveler. She was very interested in exploring, going to new places. And a lot of that does show up in her work, this idea that she's really describing things. Again, we often think of poems as being so abstract, so figurative, right? And they often are, uh, ultimately. But a lot of what we see in Bishop's work, we see really tangible, concrete, specific descriptions of specific things, whether they be animals or certain sites or just certain experiences. Very descriptive. They talk about that in the intro. A lot of detail. Again, almost sort of like a scientist, somebody with a real eye for detail, developing things specifically. Uh, so we start there. We can anchor a lot of our analysis to the specific descriptions and images that we see in her texts, and then we can extrapolate, we can move into that larger consideration of what it all means. Okay, but again, if you start uh, with the armadillo, again, notice her stanza formation. We get a series of four line stanzas. Those are quatrains, okay? So we get a whole bunch of those. Um, Again, she's pretty regular with her meter. It's not quite a set meter, but her lines are typically going to consist of either 10 syllables, 8 syllables, or 6 syllables. And she kind of alternates uh, for, uh, between those from stanza to stanza. And we also get a pretty regular rhyme scheme here. We did not see this in Wilbur, but we do get end rhyme for the most part, I don't know if she sticks with it in every single stanza, but for the most part, we get end rhyme at the end of the second and fourth lines of each stanza. And that's pretty consistent. There might be a couple of stanzas where it's more like near rhyme or slant rhyme, not an, not an exact rhyme. But for the most part, the end words of the second and fourth lines rhyme. Okay, so we have consistency and structure here at the level of stanza, have more or less with meter, though it's not a regular meter, and then we do get a regular rhyme scheme. So we can see structure, we can see patterns, but you can also really read this poem in some ways as a narrative, but again, it's, it's action-oriented. There's a lot of specific images that are getting described to us. In fact, we might even think of each stanza as sort of introducing a new image and they're all related and interconnected and they eventually take us to our destination. But we could dig into some of these specific images, just tackle a specific stanza. What's happening? Ask yourself, what's going on? What is she describing? What is happening? What are we seeing? What is the speaker of the poem seeing? What actions are occurring? Okay, think of it as action oriented. Think of it as concrete and tangible. We might end up, as we often do with poetry, thinking about figurative meaning, thinking about a spiritual level, perhaps thinking about stuff that kind of transcends everyday reality. But we don't have to spend all of our time up there in the other. We can think about concrete details, actual, you know, description and detail that we get in these early stanzas. And let's build on those. OK, let's make observations about the images, the descriptions, and then let's see where that leads us.
Okay, don't just jump all the way ahead to the theme without thinking about the journey that gets us to that theme. All right, so if we're thinking a little bit more about poetic form, obviously we can turn to Sestina, which starts on the bottom of page 55. And the book tells you that the Sestina is a particular type of poetic form. It gets handed down, I believe, from the Italian tradition. Uh, so with the Sestina, we have six line stanzas in which the end words of the first stanza, those six end words that we get in the first stanza must be used at the end of all other lines in all subsequent stanzas in sort of a rotating order. And then the final three lines of the poem must contain all six of those end words. So I think some modern readers feel like a poetic form like this maybe is a little arbitrary. Uh, again, a lot of rules. You really have to fit your work inside this closed form, but she's still able to create expression and meaning despite the what we might consider like restrictions or rules and regulations that are in place. But once we know what a sestina is, it's pretty easy to track the overall structure of the poem. So you can just start with that first stanza and underline the six end words that we see there. House, grandmother, child, stove, almanac, and tears. Okay, those are our six end words. And then you can notice that those words appear in rotating order at the end of all other lines. And then we get to the final three lines on the following page and we see all of those words. So that creates obviously a lot of repetition, okay? So what's the effect of that repetition? What is the effect of hearing and seeing those particular words repeatedly? But we see them used in slightly different ways, slightly different formulations. So think about the rotating order as well. It's not just a random assemblage of words. There's an order. There, again, there's a sort of you know internal logic at work here. So think about the words themselves, and then think about what the words are actually doing in different stanzas. How are they creating meaning? How are they creating a bit of a story here, or at least a series of impressions? You know, lyric poetry is often thought of as being sort of separate or distinct from narrative poems. Lyric poetry, or lyrical poems are usually thought of as being more focused on ideas, sensory impressions, and just sort of larger mental states, you know, sensations, feelings, moments, not so much telling stories. But, and a lot of these poems here, again, we see actions, we see a sequence of events in some cases. We see characters doing things, maybe saying things, thinking things. So we don't have to abandon a lot of our narrative impulses. We can still think of these in some cases as telling stories or at least creating a scene, creating a moment inhabited by people, uh, you know, a moment in a particular place in time. So again, there's a level of specificity in detail here that we can dig into despite the fact that we are in a closed form, an older poetic form that a lot of people might not really use anymore. Okay, so one thing to remember about Bishop also is she's often considered what was called a confessional poet. And there were a lot of these around mid-century and beyond, you know, 50s, 60s. It was considered a little bit of a new sort of uh, development or trend in American poetry. You increasingly had poets talking about their own lives, their own experiences, uh, being very expressive and in some cases personal. It's not that poets had never talked about themselves before, but it's kind of like what we said with the social realist novel. For a long time, it was considered sort of acceptable or preferable for the author to kind of efface themselves or to kind of get out of the way 
and let their their prose or their verse, their narratives or their lyric poetry sort of speak for them and you know express larger truths or maybe be realistic or or be uh, profound and beautiful or whatever. But increasingly in this sort of postmodern age that we're exploring, you know, we talked about metafiction last week in the realm of novels. But this idea that authors are a lot more willing now to call attention to their own role as writers. They're much more willing to sort of comment on the artificiality of their work. It's obviously created. It's invented. It's not real. Um, you know, and they're commenting on the process of creating the art, their own role as artists maybe interacting more directly with the audience. So they kind of mentioned this with Wilbur too, like just the fact that he really liked to share his poetry. He really liked to give public readings of his poetry, which wasn't necessarily always common with older generations of poets. But with this new kind of era that we're starting to see here, there's more of a sense of, again, maybe, maybe you know, looking more for that connection with audiences that we were talking about in week one, trying to capture those shared, lived experiences. And Bishop kind of combines what some people consider a sort of almost frosty, uh, kind of almost formal, at times academic tone. Again, lots of detail, lots of description, uh, not always clearly emoting, but yet she's like we said earlier, helping people to feel deeply. She's capturing a sense of loss or other very specific emotional states. But the way she does that often is through her form, through her structure, through her very controlled, clear, and lucid language, creating those clear structures that help us remember those strong feelings that she's bringing out. So that, that kind of ties into this idea of being a confessional poet, talking about her own life, but finding truth uh, or finding experiences that we can all relate to on some level. And that is a goal here for her and for a lot of these writers that we're exploring here at the beginning of the semester. And then if we move on uh, to one art, the final poem of hers that I wanted you guys to read on page 58 Again, we have a, an old poetic form here called the villanelle, which gets passed down from the French tradition. And again, some poets still use it. It's kind of fun. A series of three line stanzas, as we can see, uh, and then a closing quatrain, so a closing four line stanza at the end. And we notice that the first and third lines of the first stanza get repeated alternately in all subsequent stanzas. So in the case of the first line, it gets repeated pretty much verbatim in, in, in multiple other stanzas. The art of losing isn't hard to master. That gets repeated almost exactly as it appears there in that first line of the first stanza. The third line doesn't get repeated quite as exactly, but we get a repetition of the final phrase of the third line. Loss is no disaster. That doesn't always get repeated verbatim, but that basic phrase or idea gets reworked alternately and it reappears in like every other stanza from that point on. So again, this might feel like sort of an arbitrary set of rules that the poet has to follow in order to write a villanelle. And it is kind of weird, maybe to our ears, but again, let's notice what the form does. What does that repetition, what does that emphasis, that repetition creates, what does it do? Like, what effect does it have on readers? Also, again, you can think about this poem as not, as not telling a traditional story, but it is giving us sort of a sense of progression. Right. We're in, in a way we're learning how to lose things. So it's a process. Right. Just like learning anything. It's a process. It requires practice. It requires multiple steps. There'll be a progression as you get better over time at that particular skill. So 
there's a progression here that might be linked to some of the repetition that the poetic form is creating. But again, don't just think about repetition sort of at random. Think about the pattern. Think about this alternating pattern that she's using. It's a little bit different than the pattern that we see in the Sestina. So what are the effects of that pattern? You can think about it on a lot of levels as a reader. How does it sound? You should read some of these poems out loud just to yourself so you can comment on some of this auditory stuff. Like what does it sound like when we have this particular form or this particular structure? But also what does it feel like? You can get inside your inner state. What does it feel like to see the repetition, to hear the repetition, to notice an alternating pattern or structure? What does that do to the sort of emotional response of the reader? What does it do in terms of cadence, sound? What does it do just overall? What effects does it have? How might it impact readers? That's ultimately what you want to think about. And again, we can arrive at this sort of larger meaning. Uh, I think it's pretty clear in this particular poem. And again, if you look at the intro, they talk about how she's, again, sort of drawing on some of her own experiences, her own loss in her own life uh, to sort of dig into these shared experiences. But don't just skip right to the theme. Think about how the form helps to express the theme. And you can always dig into individual word choice, uh, think about connotations versus denotations, right? Uh, the difference between the associations that a word might have for us versus just like its strict dictionary definition. You can always think about stuff like that. Find specific images, find specific metaphors, and find symbols. Poetry is obviously highly symbolic. So find things that have a practical sort of material, concrete existence, like the clothes on the line in Wilbur's poem, right? Think about them as sort of everyday items first, and then think about the larger symbolic importance that they might have. You can do that with anything, with almost any item or object that gets described in a poem. Think about its sort of real-world existence, and then you can move on to thinking more about its sort of figurative or symbolic existence. Okay, so that's probably good for Bishop. Uh, let's jump ahead. I'm actually going to skip over the Berryman just in the, for the sake of time. I want to jump into the Grace Paley short story and wrap up with that. But take a look at those excerpts from the Dream Songs. That's what I assigned for Berryman. He's a bit of an acquired taste. I don't know how, how you guys are going to feel about his work. I find that Berryman typically elicits strong responses. Either people really like him or they really don't. Uh, it's fine wherever you land on that spectrum. But a few things just to observe. Again, some stuff to kind of look for if you wanted to dig in more to his, uh, to his poetry. Just some things you could consider. Some things that might uh, serve as springboards for future analysis. You can think about the inspiration. And they point this out in the intro to Berryman. He's very much inspired by Walt Whitman. Uh, in this particular uh, sequence of poems. And like Whitman in Song of Myself, which is a very famous, you know, American poem from the 19th century, like Whitman, Berryman has a, a constantly changing speaker or a sort of persona that we can identify in the dream songs. Uh, like Whitman, his speaker is fluid uh, and is sort of constantly shifting and changing, and the perspective will sometimes change a little bit. The point of view that we get in some of these different poems from Berryman, we can notice it's kind of shifting and changing. So they describe this in the book as sort of a series of alter egos that Berryman's using, and one of which, according to the editors, and I think by Berryman's own admission, 
one of these alter egos or personas is a white American minstrel performer who's often performing in blackface. So we find that pretty offensive generally in the modern day. You know, Berryman's writing these poems back in the 60s, largely. I think he wrote them over a pretty long period of time. Uh, the publication date we get in the Dream Songs here is, I believe, 1968. So a little bit outdated in terms of his racial politics, certainly. But we can think about his speaker. And the speaker might be perceived as unstable, uh, unreliable, and again, very fluid. So the tone shifts. Uh, we can notice maybe stylistic differences between different uh, different dream songs, just kind of going by the numbers, right? We get slightly different speaker personas. And by the end, that final song, number 40, I believe, that really is the voice of that white minstrel performer who's sort of impersonating an African-American, which is a bit off-putting. But you can certainly consider that as part of this larger sort of shape-shifting that we see from Berryman's speaker. So any analysis of the dream songs should really, at least in part, be about the speaker and what the speaker is doing, what the speaker is saying, and also the changes that we can observe amongst these different personas or these different versions or alter egos of the speaker. But we can also notice some things about form and structure. We might notice that we have a series of six line stanzas here. And there is some rhyme. I wouldn't call it necessarily a regular rhyme scheme, but there is a few examples of end rhyme, a lot of examples of internal rhyme, similar to what we were talking about with Wilbur. So again, he uses alliteration. He uses some examples of assonance to create near rhyme. Again, words that don't necessarily rhyme, but they have similar sounds. Uh, they have similar vowel sounds or consonant sounds that often create a certain auditory pattern that we can detect, especially if we are reading out loud. So you can look for that stuff within individual lines. Look for assonance. Look for alliteration. Those are examples that you can run with. You might not have a ton to say, but you can always get at least a few sentences out of an example of alliteration, or if you're talking about end rhyme, or if you're talking about meter. See, that can just give you material. You're, you're building, you're scaffolding, you'll fi you're, you're finding different things to talk about, so you can ultimately make an original argument about the text. But, you know, you don't have to spend the whole paper talking about internal rhyme or alliteration, but you might want to spend a body paragraph. It might just be a small part of your larger argument. So think about that. Okay, so let's jump ahead now to page 312, A Conversation with My Father by Grace Paley. So again, we're sort of shifting gears now. We're moving from poetry back over to prose fiction. So, like I said, Paley was really supposed to go along with Vonnegut and Kerouac, uh, but we're doing them separately. That's okay. But I want to remind you of something that we were discussing, particularly in relation to Vonnegut and Slaughterhouse-Five last week, which is some of the ways in which Vonnegut's taking aspects of the sort of traditional social realist novel, you know, and he's... But he's innovating by bringing in some non-traditional elements to mix in with the traditional. So we notice that in terms of like, you know, a lot of his word choice, a lot of his sentence structure, pretty recognizable, pretty normal, nothing really blowing our minds. The same with Kerouac, right? Early on, we noticed a pretty organized a uh, pretty, you know, well-structured uh, sentence style. He's not doing anything crazy, at least at first. We notice that things open up. Uh, he starts to kind of get maybe a little bit more subversive as On the Road goes on. He starts to break more grammatical rules. He starts to break his own patterns of how he sort of divides up clauses. 
So we notice that with both of those authors, they're using a lot of traditional elements, but in the style of a lot, in the sort of, you know, in, in the, in the, same way that a lot of these other postmodern writers are, they're trying to find new stuff to do with a lot of this old material. So trying to do new things with the novel. So part of how they're doing that is sort of getting back to a more colloquial sort of idiomatic style of expression. We notice that with both of them, right? It's trying to sort of get away from like the elevated language and the formality that we often find in older literature. So we notice that, uh, and again, they're pretty routine with their sentence structure, but then with, with Vonnegut in particular, we noticed a few pretty specific postmodern flourishes that he was sort of bringing to the table in Slaughterhouse Five. So I mentioned a few of these last week bringing in a lot of other texts. We noticed that, right? Bringing in other books other texts of various kinds, right? A history book, um, something about the Crusades, a song, a limerick, right? All these other texts, right? That's characteristic of a lot of postmodern literature. Again, trying to capture what it feels like to live in a more modern world, even in the late 20th century, it might feel old to us. But even then, they were surrounded by a lot of different texts, advertising, you know, newspapers, magazines, TV, a lot of different media. Uh, and a lot of authors were trying to sort of express how that felt because it was kind of a new thing. It was different than previous generations who had less media, less entertainment options, right? So that's a characteristic of late 20th century stuff. So we noticed that in Vonnegut, bringing in a lot of these other texts, which are all kind of interacting with his text. But also we notice the metafictional qualities. And they mention metafiction here in relation to Paley as well. I think they call it sort of like exploratory fiction. Or like just sort of, again, this idea of fiction that's interested in its own fictionality. Fiction that acknowledges its own fictionality. And part of that, we mentioned this with Kerouac too, part of that is referentiality. Referencing a lot of other texts. Almost like a sort of an admission or an acknowledgement that, hey, I created this in part out of all of these older texts, right? Sort of wearing their influences and some of their, uh, you know, inspirations kind of on their sleeve. Like we mentioned that with Kerouac, a lot of references uh, that take us outside of the text, right? But a lot of those things would either be sort of pop culture images or ideas, or they might be other authors, other texts, which inform this current text. But also we talked about how Vonnegut's narrator is taking a pretty active role in that first chapter that we read. So again, that's kind of part of the larger sort of metafictional quality that he's striving for in that novel. The narrator is very much talking about the process of writing the book that would ultimately become Slaughterhouse-Five, right? He's talking about it. He's making jokes about it. At one point, he even says what he wrote is bad. <laughs> He'll write a better one later. Uh, so he's talking about his process. He's talking a little bit about his own role as writer. And again, we don't have to necessarily read that narrator as a direct stand-in for Vonnegut. It's sort of like a persona, right? The narrator almost becomes a character in and of himself. And he interacts with other characters, perhaps. He talks directly to the audience. So again, these are innovations. These are sort of postmodern touches. And the final one that we talked about with Vonnegut was just the way he handles chapters. Just the fact that the chapter that we read in a more traditional novel would have been called the preface or the epil or, or the, 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 the sort of like the foreword, like the, the preliminary chapter that we get to before the main action begins. But Vonnegut doesn't do that. He, oft he also gets rid of the epilogue which would be sort of the final chapter. He doesn't call it that. He just numbers 
what would have been the preface, what would have been the epilogue. He just gives them standard chapter numbers like any other chapter. So they point that out, again, as an innovation, right? Because a, a, a more traditional author would have had a preface where, yeah, maybe they're talking to the audience, talking about how they wrote the book, but that's separate from the action of the book, right? That's separate. That's, that's set off from the regular chapters. But Vonnegut isn't creating those clear dividing lines between the little intro where he's talking about writing or his narrator is and the actual heart of the story. It all kind of gets jumbled together. It all becomes part of this larger whole. So we can find those innovations and those are things that we can explore further. We can think about what they do, what they add, and what effects they have on readers. So here with Paley, we can do a similar thing. We can notice, as they point out in the intro, that this is in many ways a pretty realistic short story. And it has a lot of traditional elements that we recognize in a lot of prose, a lot of short stories and novels, particularly a heavy reliance on dialogue. In fact, I mean, the title says it all. The, the whole story is really just a long conversation between two characters, right? And we learn almost everything through dialogue, right? Through what they say to each other. We get a little bit of exposition from our narrator where she describes a few things. But for the most part, a lot of the story consists of dialogue. And that's not terribly new or earth shattering. But what they point out, again, is that she's taking traditional elements and mixing them with what we might consider non-traditional or more innovative elements. And here, a lot of that has to do, once again, with this idea of metafiction, because this story is largely about writing. It's largely about how we tell stories, particularly how we tell women's stories. So if you read the intro to Paley, they mentioned that a big thematic concern for her throughout her career, something she wrote about a lot, really, was sort of how women's stories get told. And that was something she had a lot of personal investment in. And a lot of her fiction centers around women who are sort of on their own, like single women who have to make their way in the world. And that's obviously often difficult and you know this this particular piece was written in the 70s but you know just going back to past decades they have a lot of obstacles to overcome they're often met with hostility they're often living in a world that wasn't really designed for them again not just women but single women who are often kind of on their own and that can often create sort of social problems or obstacles for them. And we see evidence of that here in this story. But there's a lot of ways that Paley draws attention to the fact that we are talking about fiction. This is a story about writing stories to an extent. We get that really at the very beginning when her father asks her to write a simple story just once more. Uh, and he references a couple of older writers, including Chekhov. So again, this is kind of a characteristic move. Chekhov was a Russian writer, often considered to be a real master of the short story form. And a lot of his short stories are kind of traditional in their construction. They're really tight, well-organized, usually not very long. And there's usually kind of a clear moral or theme that we can take away from them, which people generally like. I mean, they're, they're easy to kind of teach and digest in relatively, you know, short time frames. So he mentions Chekhov. He wants her to write a story like that, something traditional, something simple, something that he would recognize. So then what we get on a couple of occasions here are attempts by our speaker or our narrator to create a story uh, that might satisfy what her father wants. But in both cases, he kind of rejects the story. Um, or at the very least, he's kind of dismissive about the female characters depicted in these stories. 
So you guys can see what the father's attitude is and how this conversation about fiction, about storytelling, ultimately says a lot about the relationship between these two characters, our narrator and her father. Right? What the father thinks about the women in these stories is, in some ways, similar to what he thinks about the narrator herself. And she's trying to claim or reclaim a certain amount of ownership over her fictional creations. So this is really a, a, a sort of a powerful passage near the end of the story on page 316. When she's talking about the woman, you know, across the street that she told that second story about. And she says, you know, that woman, that character, she's my knowledge and my invention. And she's talking about, again, how women's stories get told. And perhaps just as importantly, who gets to tell them, right? Uh, because we see, uh, uh, you know, her father's perspective, which seems to indicate that life for a single woman is kind of over by the time they hit 40. You know, they're largely defined by their roles as wives or mothers. And clearly, Paley, or at least her narrator, is sort of rejecting that way of thinking, uh, rejecting that logic and saying, no, she can be anything, right? She has so much more life to live. She can overcome this past tragedy and she can be whatever she wants to be. Her life can be whatever she wants it to be. But for her father, the story is over, right? It's a tragedy. It's over. It's done. There's no second act. There's no third act. There's no hope. So we can observe those opinions, but again, there's larger social commentary here, obviously, about women, their roles in society, and again, who gets to tell their stories and how those stories get to go. We get all of that, but a lot of that gets delivered through what we might consider formal innovations. So not only the fact that we get these other texts, right? We get these other texts kind of like in Slaughterhouse-Five, other texts brought into this text, right? So we have stories within the story. They're all being told by the same person, but that creates this sort of multi-textual effect that is common in postmodern literature. But also we get sort of explicit commentary about the act of writing, uh, the role of a writer, and sort of, you know, just larger questions and ideas surrounding all of that. So ultimately, we get something here that's kind of ironic, playful in a way, sort of subversive. Again, taking traditional elements of prose fiction and doing some new stuff with them, using those traditional elements to make new points, uh, you know, to talk about sort of... Uh, art and the creation of art in a new and interesting way. So it's playful. It's a little bit subversive. It still contains a clear message. But again, that message is largely delivered through some of these postmodern formal or structural innovations, both the metafictional stuff and just the fact that she's bringing in these other texts, these other references to help her talk about writing, the role of the writer, and what it means going forward, right? There's a maybe a kind of a forward-looking move here that feels right for this era and this, you know, historical period that we're sort of exploring here. So just a few things that you could grab hold of and do more with. Always do that close reading. Always dig into some individual words, phrases. Anytime you're dealing a lot with dialogue, you should always grab words. Think about vocabulary, word choice. What do the words say about the characters saying the words? How is there a give and take? How does the conversation ebb and flow? But then, of course, you could also dig into these little brief narratives that we get embedded within the larger story. It's a lot going on with those. So there's a lot of formal work that you could do here on the level of words and sentences. Again, thinking about some of those um, metafiction elements or these postmodern innovations. But you could also do a pretty traditional character study. 
where you really just dig into these two characters. Or maybe think about the woman being described by the narrator as an important third character. Right? What do we know about these people? Uh, what do they make us feel? How are they functioning within the narrative? Again, the characters, the word choice, and all of these formal innovations are all adding up to express the theme. So there's no shortage of options. You just have to identify the stuff that's most interesting to you, generate original ideas about them, and that's how you'll end up ultimately with an original uh, interpretation and conclusion. Okay, so hopefully this is a little bit helpful. Again, don't feel like you have to do all the stuff that I'm doing. You just need to be making some similar moves, identifying some similar items to analyze later. And we should be doing that no matter what we read. So I will see you guys next week. We'll take a look at a play and we'll think a little bit more about African-American literature in the late 20th century.